So I'm going to be speaking to you about our approach to trying to understand what is happening with, with uh, ME. Um, I work, I'm a psychiatrist, I work in the Center for Infection and Immunity at Columbia uh, University, and we've been long interested in trying to understand how to take all of the clues relating to a potential infection and to put them toge together with clues for disease. But we're not early. We weren't early to this process. It uh, was already happening uh, with Esquirol back in the early 1800s where the, he was noting that there were many times when there would be an epidemic, when independently of, of moral causes or immoral causes, I guess, too, insanity would suddenly seem to extend to a great number of individuals. We can derive a lot of clues on, uh, on this basis. And one of the approaches that we take is really a framework that allows us to try to understand disease. And I call it the three strikes hypothesis. And in order to understand who gets sick, when, where, and why, you need to think about the genes, the environmental factors, and the timing, the temporal context in which the genes and the environment intersect. And uh, in what uh, you'll see in a moment, like we call our Da Vinci slide, um, we see this interaction through the process of earth, even fetal development is interaction between genetic factors, epigenetic factors, and uh, environmental exposures. And we are looking at these interactions both prenatally as well as in postnatal uh, periods for the development of early childhood disorders, autism, uh, obsessive comp compulsive disorder, a disorder called PANDAS, which I'll tell you about a little bit later, but also in middle life, things like uh, MECFS, depression, schizophrenia, and then in later life, our, uh, Alzheimer disease and Parkinson's disease. These are disorders that where they, the roots of these disorders may be laid down through fetal programming, prenatal programming, but also in early childhood life and then also throughout later life with subsequent triggers, perhaps additional viral exposures or even just bad eating, disnu disnutrition, et, et cetera. And the idea that microbes may be associated with brain disorders is not a, a new one, and there have been a whole host of agents that have been implicated. Viruses, you know, bacteria, et cetera. And many of these, we've been uh, looking in animal models, uh, you know, many individuals look in animal models and, and uh, have seen evidence of behavioral abnormalities and brain structural abnormalities that are reminiscent of the features that we see in disorders like autism and so forth. There have been some in ME-CFS as well, but many, many fewer. And uh, if you look also within the disorders themselves, there's also been a great effort to try to identify immune factors in association with uh, classical brain or classical mental health conditions, ranging from this disorder called PANDAS, which is associated with uh, a group A beta hemolytic streptococcal infection, Tourette disorder, Sydenham Korea, which is a classical uh, neuroimmune disorder associated with uh, group A beta hemolytic strep, autism, OCD, schizophrenia, and then even ME-CFS. But even in disorders that we know are genetically coded, such as Rett syndrome and Down syndrome, which have you know brain features which we tend to think of as being linked solely to the genetic factors, even there, you see immune disturbances, you see abnormal reaction to a variety of infectious agents, and we, you know, so, so there may be some other elements uh, there, there as well. So a variety of brain disorders, whether they have very strong or less strong or moderate genetic uh, components, have immune disturbances that are associated with them that may play a very strong role in the types of behaviors and neurological features and other uh, bodily and systemic features that uh, are evident in these disorders. And if you are in, in the efforts to try to make a link between one infectious agent and, and disease, we've uh, you know, tried to go through various uh, logical postulates in a, in a way. And Koch was the first to uh, really formulate in a very explicit way the, the germ theory of disease. And he said it was a one-to-one -one relationship. You have one microbe, it's going to happen in every case of that specific disease and required that to happen 
uh, and you had to be able to take the microbe and put it into an animal model and then see the feature. There are some animal models where we can do this um, in, uh, and, and create a, a, a brain disorder associated with this, but it's a much more complicated scenario. We have to think about how the host response, the immune response uh, of, of the host, which Rivers proposed uh, as an adaptation in 1937, and uh, later on, also the fact that we can de detect with such exquisite sensitivity through the process of called PCR molecular techniques, we can find exquisitely the uh, presence of even a you know one uh, you know one sequence uh, that is associated with a bacterium, for example. It may not be culturable. It may not be able to be replicated anymore. Our sensitivity is is is, is that high, uh, and we have a corollary type of uh, process that uh, in, the, uh, in, in the idea of thinking about an autoimmune reaction and disease. And we do think that many of these uh, infectious agents, part of the way in which we end up with a brain disorder, as you've heard so in such uh, elegant fashion, many of our speakers this morning, thinking about the way in which infectious and other agents may induce autoantibodies that are then going after various proteins that are important in brain function. And so this, is, uh, this was a concept at first in the 1950s. It was considered an absolute you no-no. Know, uh, you know, it was called the horror autotoxicus. It was not supposed to be able to happen that you could have a body that would react against itself. Well, how could that be evolutionarily you know, ben beneficial? But it indeed, uh, indeed was, uh, t t and it took a lot to overcome that. Uh, that prejudice, if you will, and again, similar to what Koch was, Koch was saying, you know, it should be one antibody, you know, one disease, and you should be able to put it into an animal model and get everything uh, that you know reminiscent of the human uh, disorder. Um, and uh, it is not as easy as as all of that. First of all, we have difficulties in understanding the process. Um, of uh, with with the germ theory that we sometimes can't isolate or grow the uh, the, the particular microbe, sometimes with antibodies, with autoantibodies as, we, as you've seen today, it's a very careful process, uh, but sometimes a very elusive process to find the autoantibody or to even know what it's going after. You can presume that there may be an autoantibody, and th there's been great work to de determine many of them, uh, but we still have many suggestions that there is an autoimmune process without being able to find the autoantibody in some, in some circumstances. And we also have the problem that many of us in this room are probably carrying antibodies in our bloodstream that are reactive against brain tissues um, and could be potentially you know, offensive to our health. However, we have to, so, so we, you know, we, not all of us are getting sick, right? So we need to try to think about how can that happen? How do we put this together so that we can make sense of why we may be able to find these antibodies in the bloodstream of individuals who aren't sick? And so we have something called the blood-brain barrier, for example, that is a protective uh, it, it, uh, lining with uh, tight junctions of endothelial cells. And uh, these these are generally going to you know prevent most of your uh, most molecules from pass passing through. Um, however, this barrier is subject to a disintegration, a loosening up, if you will, of these tight junctions in response to a variety of factors, including cytokines, including endotoxin, lipopolysaccharides, the out outer uh, uh, proteins that are associated with bacteria, um, uh, viral proteins uh, as well, as well as certain uh, hormonal effects can allow the blood-brain barrier to open up and to, uh, to, to have this, the passage uh, through. But in addition, we also have the, uh, the circumventricular organs, which are not protected by a blood-brain barrier. So we still have this problem. You know, we could say normal person carries these antibodies that could be offensive, blood-brain barriers intact, so you, they don't have a problem. However, if those antibodies were able to react against the circumventricular organs, which include parts of the hypothalamus, 
um, you know, and uh, and certain brainstem organs, we have we have uh, we have this problem that we um, you know we we don't know why they wouldn't actually have this reaction. Is there something affecting the capacity of certain antibodies to bind? Maybe certain isotypes or subclasses of antibodies are more capable of binding. And we also know that redox or oxidative stress may, in some instances, uh, prevent or or uh, or exacerbate uh, the binding of autoantibodies to uh, to certain proteins, and that could perhaps be, you know, a factor in in determining who gets sick and why, and you know, and or why not. Um, why do we think about ME and autoantibodies in, in an autoimmune process? Well, there are many clues. This is uh, uh, taken from a, a recent paper by. Uh, Morris and, and Michael Mace's group. So there are a variety of, neuro, of uh, autoantibodies that have been uh, that have been detected. Um, of course, we also have the clinical treatment response, and can say indirectly that you know they got better with rituximab, and perhaps you know that that makes sense in that in that context. Um, and also that we have a variety of agents, viral infections and bacterial uh, agents that could, through a process of molecular mimicry, you know, going uh, look at having looked looked like something that is in your body already uh, as a natural self protein. Um, and so there are many reasons to believe that this may be, uh, this may be the case. Furthermore, we have evidence of uh, changes in oxidative stress and mitochondrial pathways that may exacerbate the reactivity in an autoimmune type of di direction uh, in MACFS. So many considerations that one needs to, to go, go, going from conjecture um, and trying to answer, you know, a whole host of, uh, of questions, um, you know, who gets sick, are there uh, immune response genes perhaps, or, uh, or, or particular genes that are relating to infectious disease susceptibility, uh, are there shared uh, epitopes, and, you know, what are these self-antigens that are being uh, uh, attacked by the, uh, these uh, cross-reactive antibodies. When the exposure occurs, where in the host is probably also important, um, and then how, you know, it's sort of how are these agents getting in. Microbial translocation, we could even have a leaky gut that's allowing things into the bloodstream which normally wouldn't be there. And, uh, and furthermore, you know, there's the consideration of why and perhaps maybe we carry these antibodies because these we may use some of these naturally cross-reactive natural autoantibodies as a first line of defense in some circumstances. So um, we have uh, a, an animal model that is a, an example of how one can go from the idea that an infection can lead to an autoimmune response and how the autoimmune response can then mimic certain aspects of behavior and neurological uh, abnormalities. And this is based upon the group A beta hemolytic strep story, which uh, was associated with Sydenham, uh, Korea, or St. Vitus dance. Um, and is uh, associated with the acute onset of obsessive compulsive uh, symptoms, anxiety, and ticks. And it, there was a biological sort of marker on B, uh, on B lymphocytes um, that uh, is found in uh, individuals, or had been found in individuals who were at risk of rheumatic fever as well, which is one of the other consequences, rheumatic heart disease, another consequence of a group A beta, beta hemolytic strep infection in those who are susceptible to autoimmune disease. And what's interesting, and is particularly in the context of what, what types of treatment considerations we should be thinking about if ME were to be shown to be likely to be autoimmune, um, then, you know, we would be thinking about plasma exchange, IVIG, um, or perhaps even antibiotics if there are certain triggering bacterial infections that you'd want to prevent. Uh, from keeping on triggering the disorder. So our animals end up with backflips. They look like little circus mice. Um, and uh, when, we, when we immunize them, we basically give them, it's not an infection, we give them dead strep. So they have this increase in these, uh, these rearing moves. And if you, oops, let's see, get that there. So um, that guy with the black uh, on his tail is uh, doing this most of his day, these repetitive movements, which are related to the antibodies that you can see here. This, this cage mate is uh, not immunized, uh, no black on the tail, and we'll just 
hang out and observe his neighbor. Uh, but we have antibodies that are uh, in, the, uh, in the brain of the panda's mice and also in their serum that will react with striatal uh, basal ganglia uh, neurons. We took the process uh, that Koch had laid out for the germ theory and, uh, and combined with Lutetsky's criteria and did what was called passive immunization, taking the blood from the IgG from animals that had been directly immunized and putting it into naive mice. Um, and then looking for the deposits is, is the hippocampus. This is the de dentate gyrus of the hippocampus looking for the uh, immunoglobulin deposits in the brain. And we saw also that if we gave this direct, uh, the serum from the directly immunized mice to naive mice, you saw this rearing behavior. If you depleted the IgG, the active principle uh, it from, from the serum, you, uh, you lost this effect, and you didn't see it with PBS serum um, or, the, uh, or the other controls. We determined after about six months of looking for the target of this uh, you know, putative autoantibody that it, must, it was likely to be a conformational antibody, so we had to use uh, non-denaturing uh, uh, techniques, uh, well, immunoblot actually, and, uh, and then uh, non-denaturing immunoprecipitation and found after subjecting this to mass spec that there were, uh, uh, that the targets appeared to be complement C4, which is known to be antibodies to C4B uh, are present in lupus, for example, um, and uh, also antibodies against alpha-2 macroglobulin in, macroglobulin in, the, in the cerebellum and um, also heat shock protein 70, you had heard about heat shock protein 60 earlier. Um, what we did was then clone the human homologue. This was a mouse model, so we took the human homologue of this, uh, of this heat shock protein 70 and uh, put it into a suitable vector. This is a commercial antibody against heat shock protein 70, and you can see the, uh, the reactivity there. And these are children who had this disorder of pandas from Sue Suedo's collection at, uh, at uh, NIMH. These were children who went on to have a positive response to plasmapheresis after the onset of their illness post uh, group A beta hemostrep infection. And then these are the, the normal healthy controls. So you see that there, you know, we, we were able to detect uh, through our discovery process using conformational techniques the heat shock protein 70 uh, as, a, uh, as a, one of the targets and seem to be specific. Why heat shock protein 70? Why, what would that have to do with anything? Well, in this case, this wasn't even an infection. It was an immunization. It was an immune exposure because it was dead strep. Um, and so there are a variety of uh, cell stressors uh, in, in, at the mitochondrial level uh, a, a, as well that involve heat shock proteins and more than I can do than, uh, other than to allude to it, but really important in thinking about how the oxidative stress drives our immune system and perhaps creates a bias towards autoimmune responses under sele select circumstances. So. Our group has been in the business of uh, doing what we call pathogen de-discovery. We try to do pathogen discovery, but um, you know, in, in so doing, we're not always successful in finding an agent that actually is an active correlate of disease, but rather we set up our, uh, our studies so that we will have as much chance to see what truth there is out there if we, if we, can, if we, if we can find it. Um, we set up a multi-sender study. We usually have taken community uh, input into design of studies as well, um, and using a very careful blinding technique, um, our site usually serves as sort of a clearinghouse with multi multiple layers of blinding in the sample codes so that there, you know, isn't any tendency, not that there's anything necessarily malicious going on, but, uh, or that would happen, but rather really very important in this technique, these techniques to be really sure. As most of you know, uh, we, you know, our group was, uh, did not find any evidence of an association with XMRV or with MLV with, with MECFS. We similarly have looked in other disorders for an association with other infectious agents. This is a, a study, large multicenter study for Bornavirus and neuropsychiatric disease. MECFS had also been, uh, been uh, implicated in Bornavirus. We had uh, also shown that, that uh, in a smaller study that that also was not an associate with MECFS. In autism, we found no association between measles virus in the gastrointestinal tract 
and, uh, and, and autistic uh, disorder. But we did find, using those same materials that we used for the autism disorder, we did find that there was a very uh, severe process with, with uh, dysbiosis, and also they, there was a, an association with absolutely obliterated uh, disaccharides, so the, the uh, carbohydrate metabolism was just obliterated. You can see this in the, the autism kids. Um, and uh, it wasn't because of the enterocytes being gone, because the villain, which is an enterocyte specific marker, was not effective. And we have uh, in the bacterial uh, communities that we saw there, in association with that, we saw a great reduction in ba bacteria deets, uh, both in the ileum and, the, and, in, the, uh, and in the cecum. And we found an association between the level of reduction in the carbohydrate metabolism and the elevation in inflammatory markers, along with this change in the microbiome in these, uh, in these, uh, in these children. And so, you know, this is, I think, is, is a source of uh, interest. In, in particular, in the context of talking about MECFS, there is a very strong indication that there is a subset of individuals with autism who have uh, autoantibodies that are reactive against uh, neural proteins, um, and they, this subset tends to be the kids who are, uh, have both autism and severe GI disturbances. And whether this relates or not to the microbiota changes, we don't know, but we, we strongly suspect that there's a, there's a close relationship there. Our ongoing MECFS studies um, are, uh, are leveraging um, some beautiful collections um, that uh, and I'm really very proud to have uh, these, uh, these great collaborators. Um, for the Chronic Fatigue Initiative, uh, Dr. Dan Peterson, somewhere in the audience, is, is one of the members of, of that uh, uh, clinician group, as well as the NIH study. Um, so it's all th throughout the U.S. and also a study uh, specifically uh, run out of Stanford for, with Jose Montoya, um, and, and a very intriguing study on spinal fluid uh, that uh, uh, Dan Peterson had collected 60 cases, and then we had uh, 60 comparators and con controls and then uh, are engaging now in looking at what we call an unusual cases study that have uh, MECFS, but also other types of features and cancers and so forth that might make them of, uh, of great interest. Our approach in our, uh, in our search for pathogens um, is a, sort of a stage strategy. We typically begin with a mass tag approach, which looks at a, a, a variety of agents that I will show you in a in a moment, and then we also are doing uh, bacterium and micro microbiome uh, now um, in, with some new collections that we're taking up uh, starting next week um, in, a, in a small pilot for the microbiome. We do RNA-seq and we're doing a, a variety of things at the protein level as, as well. Um, and uh, in the future, we're hoping to do a longitudinal analysis, which you'll see for in a moment why we have such interest. Our panels uh, uh, go after a set of DNA and RNA agents that were selected by our clinician working group uh, as a starting point. We have found uh, very little, uh, much to our surprise, in the serum of, the, of these individuals, two uh, HHV6 uh, type B, one parvovirus B19, both agents, by the way, that can be associated with autoimmune. Uh, scenarios. Um, we have also in the, uh, uh, using high throughput sequencing, um, found very, very little um, uh, overall. And the HHV6 uh, that was found there was really no, not significantly different than the prevalence in, uh, in controls. Um, using the samples from uh, uh, Jose Montoya's uh, study in Stanford, we also found very little um, one, one HHV6B, again, this is in the plasma. Anella viruses, which you heard about a little bit earlier, is per perhaps harboring some sequences that may cross-react with uh, self-antigens, and then also retroviral reads. Now, important to note, serum, this would be free virus, free bacteria uh, that we would be looking for. So now we are looking within PBMC with the hope that, and these studies are ongoing, with the hope that we will be able to detect more agents that are harbored intercellularly. 
As an associate to this and an additional clue to infection and to autoimmunity, we are pursuing cytokines. We have, uh, I don't have uh, uh, enough time to really go through all of these scenarios, except to say that what we found is if we were looking at cases as a whole, we would see very little of a difference from uh, controls. However, when you distinguish between cases of relatively new onset, less than or equal to three years, versus longer duration subjects, you see that there is, a, uh, is an increase in the pro, is a variety of pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, including IL-17A, um, uh, in the short duration subjects. But they also have so-called TH2, or autoimmune subtype of, uh, of cytokines, IL-4, 10, 13, and also this IL-1 receptor antagonist. Um, the, we were very interested because many of the uh, cytokines that came up in our broad panel uh, were suggestive of an allergic uh, phenomenon, and many, uh, you know, there are many sort of cross reactions. There are um, many ways in which these agents can work, but it has been speculated in the past, and there are some findings that suggest the presence of allergic disorders, particularly in fibromyalgia subtypes of, of ME, but also in other, uh, in other subtypes. And again, you can see here that if you're looking the three, less than three years versus the uh, longer duration subjects, uh, increase in IL-4, IL-10, IL-13, IL-17A, and then also reduction in the eosinophil uh, uh, chemotactic agent, which is uh, e eataxin, it's a trend anyway. Um, and if you look at, we, we tried to understand this uh, further, um, to some degree you can explain at least IL-17A, those individuals who have allergies, who are short duration, have the highest in the IL-17A, but borderline significance. So it's a complex scenario, one that we're trying to figure out uh, more carefully. We have had uh, similar patterns, similar but opposite patterns, um, in our overview of the spinal fluid cytokines in, our, uh, in the sample set th that we have done with uh, Dr. Dan Peterson. And uh, so in, when you're looking at cases versus controls, you see here again IL-1 beta, 17A, um, 6, uh, interferon gamma, and CNF-alpha are reduced. Eataxin is in the opposite direction uh, to, to the others. But if you look at um, and is again IL-4 and IL-10. But if you, if you try to subset the individuals according to their phenotype, the subjects who have classic CFS, sort of the standard parameters, as opposed to people who have more complex scenarios, maybe a more gradual onset, more, more comorbidities, that uh, in green here you can see that, that the classic subjects have m many, many increases in these cytokines. So the pattern is very different. Clinical phenotype is probably critical. MECFS is heterogeneous, and we need to understand and dissect that heterogeneity to understand the biology of this, of this disorder. Um, this is just a network association. We just look at cases versus controls. Uh, as by and large, cases have much more co-association, much more activation of multiple, multiple pathways versus the controls. Um, and you see a little bit more in the short duration spinal fluid uh, samples but not that much more, you know, but it's, it's not as striking as it is when you're looking versus controls. I just want to, su I want to sum up on thinking about how the gastrointestinal tract and the microbiome might, re might relate to autoimmunity and might relate to these cytokine surges. There are, uh, there's uh, many, many different factors that, that, that could be involved, but epigenetic re regulation in the GI tract is, is very tightly related to your redox status. And the uh, cysteine um, and glutathione levels in your GI tract are very, very important in, uh, in controlling the redox environment and, and whether that tips over into oxidative stress or not. This decides largely the degree to which you have made a hospitable or an inhospitable environment for certain bacteria versus others. So this is really critical in, uh, in setting the stage for how your microbiota and your GI tract will uh, respond and which bacteria you have will also determine how well you can break your foods down and pass nutrients along into your bloodstream, tryptophan and, and, uh, and serotonin, for, you know, for example. Um, and it also alters 
Treg cells, these Tregs, when they are, are cells that are helpful generally in protecting against autoimmunity, um, and then Th17 cells um, are uh, upregulated by by some of uh, some of these various mi microbiome microbiome uh, factors. They also have a very important relationship with the tryptophan degradation pathway. This is very important uh, in determining your oxidative stress, it's, uh, uh, but it also is really key in factors like memory uh, consolidation. So um, if you don't have this kinurenin pathway active to some degree, you can't have working memories and you fail to have consolidation of, uh, of memories. There are effects on glutamatergic system, the NMDA receptors uh, as, uh, as well as uh, effects that go into the, uh, the uh, uh, mitochondrial system with, through niacin synthesis. And the, this enzyme called IDO uh, is, is, triggers this, it's, by, it's activated by cytokines and these uh, various uh, infectious agents can uh, regulate um, uh, this, this system. And so we're very intrigued in looking both at the pathogens as well as the microbiota that are there. Many animal models that we can find that are showing evidence that intestinal microbes are very key in modulating autoimmunity. We see it in type 1 diabetes, you know, a very classical uh, autoimmune disease. Uh, and uh, so we, we feel that this is a very important uh, process to, to, uh, to pursue. Um, but we, you know, so we need these bugs though. Um, it, you don't have a normal brain if you don't have a normal gut micro, uh, microbiota, but you probably need a good balance between being germ-free and having the right pathogens that are helping your brain along, providing tryptophan for serotonin synthesis, for example. But you also have the pathogens that you have to concern, concern yourselves with, um, or that we have to all concern ourselves with. We are pursuing the microbiome. As I said, we are starting a pilot study next week uh, for, through the CFI in a small study, uh, and we also are doing metabolomics, proteomics, and again, looking within white blood cells in order to determine whether they harbor different agents. I just want to show you very one little hot off the press in our metabolomics, which uh, surveys a whole host of, uh, of metabolites, um, that we have found that there is a, 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 a molecule called AZMA, which is uh, the asymmetric di dimethyl arginine, which is involved in nitric oxide and peroxynitride and oxidative stress, that um, we have found that our sh it's, if you look at all of the subjects with MECFS, there's no difference from controls. But you see that the short duration subjects have a significantly decreased ADMA compared to control. So you get a reduced ADMA level that keeps ADMA from being able to block this uh, pathway towards oxidative stress. Uh, so you get more oxidative stress, you actually ha have uh, reduced uh, dimethylamine and de reduced uh, cit citrulline as, uh, as well. So just in conclusion, you know, I, I, I like to use this slide because, you know, this was sort of one of those paradigm changers, the whole idea that uh, ulcers could actually be caused by a bug as opposed to stress, which we had spent centuries thinking about uh, stress as, a, as the sole cause of, uh, of ulcers, um, and we preparing our minds for thinking differently. So I, I really love this quote, you know, so Einstein said, you know, students come to him, the questions of this year, this exam, the same as last year, yes, true, as I said, but this year, all the answers are different. So um, this work takes a village, and uh, I am deeply grateful to all of our collaborators, uh, both internal to our center as, and, as well as outside. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll have time for a couple of questions, please. Hello. I've got a couple of questions. Um, has anyone tried injecting mouse, um, sorry, serum from ME patients into mice, and does it make any difference? I do they develop ME symptoms? And secondly, uh, is there any role for probiotics in people with ME? Yeah, so, so were you saying to take serum from, you know, to take an, uh, antibodies from IgG from, uh, I can't see where the person is, I'm not localizing well. Um, so, um, uh, so was it to take IgG and to put it into, yeah. So I think that that's actually, um, that's a, that I, th I don't know that anybody's done that. I think that would be a very interesting thing to do. 
Um, I, I would probably want to do some exploration first to try to uh, see within you know, larger groups of human subjects, um, uh, you know, whether, because I do think that, that uh, ME-CFS is a highly, highly heterogeneous disorder. And if there is an autoimmune subset, which I do think that there probably is, it's not, I, I doubt that it will be everybody. And so I think that that's an important uh, thing to do. So one, one can look at infections that are common to a particular, uh, you know, individual, but also screening for certain types of antibodies first, perhaps, as a, as, a, as a first step. Gentleman there, and then Angela, please, Francis. Well, shortly. Uh, did you mention that the pro-inflammatory cytokines were decreased in the CSF in those patients? And my question is that uh, you also mentioned the complement system, but I wonder if you have measured the C3 and C4 uh, split products to see if you have any activation as an indication of LPS mechanism involved. You do not need to uh, antibodies It's a here. great idea. We've not done that yet. We're using one, you know, it's a limited resource, so we've done a 51-plex cytokine um, a, a analysis to, to conserve and to get as much answer from one, from one uh, thing. But just note also that it was the CFS patients as a whole that had reduced levels, but when you split into the classic patients, they tended to have actually significantly elevated levels too. So again, but it, I, it, the, your question still, you know, is, uh, is, is very warranted, yeah. Andrew? Um, this is just a response really to the first question. Uh, the ideal situation would be to, to have a patient with classical ME who responded to plasma exchange to collect the first 200 mils of plasma concentrate the IgG and inject that into mice. Now the main trouble here is that one doesn't really know what to look at, look for in the mice because there is no very classical signature of disease in the patients. And this would make the, that experiment pretty difficult. But as a, as a sort of one way of going forward, yes, of course it is an experiment that should be done, but you'd have to have some very careful behavioral testing in the mice because it's unlikely that they're going to show very clear features and you'll need some very subtle and lots of mice and lots of plasma to do the experiments. And it must be from a patient who you know gets, has some response to plasma exchange so that you really feel confident that there is something in there which is causing the disease. Thank you. The gentleman here, could you pass it along, Francis? Having a... <coughs> Yeah, a healthy gut microbiome seems to be a marker of well-being uh, right across the board. Um, do you think that that's a consequence of other factors which contribute to well-being, or do you think actually the, the, the microbiome that a healthy person has got, is that driving their well-being? And the subsidiary question is, if that's the case, should we be undertaking the rather pleasant or unpleasant uh, treatment of um, fecal transplanting? Well, there is a, a, a doc in Australia who's been trying what he calls bacteria therapy for ME for about uh, with some, some uh, high level reported success and, and so forth. But I think that your question is, is, is a very important one. I think we have so much to do in terms of microbiome research that I couldn't possibly be honest and say that I knew one way or the other. We don't even really know the extent to which uh, genetic differences alter the microbiome uh, and so forth. We know that there are some diet resistance enterotypes. We know that you know it's three major enterotypes, and some suggestion that one that happens to have Prevotella predominance that uh, that, that that's the uh, enterotype that is more difficult to shift. You know, let's say if you're starting on the Mediterranean diet or something, it's it's, it's more difficult to shift it away from that. Um, from that from that answer type, um, but that's through diet exchange. Whether we then just need to go to some type of very strong antibiotic followed by you know uh, you know a, a fecal transplants or 
I don't know, poop in a pill sounds, you know, I don't know, it's, I don't know which one sounds worse, but, uh, you know, um, but there, there, there are some groups actually now that are doing uh, sort of what I call the perfume approach, um, a little bit of this bacterium from the peach, petri dish and a little bit of that bacterium from the petri dish, and uh, you can imagine that there may be custom blends that based upon somebody's precision medicine, you know, and genetics and perhaps life, you know, uh, habits, you may need to tweak things, you know, one way or the other. But one, one thing that does stri strike me is that, uh, is that, you know, beyond the ick factor, um, if you take the condition, at least in the U.S., that there is a, um, a, a an approved, uh, an approval for the use of fecal transplants, which is in C. difficile uh, infections that are, you know, recalcitrant and, and, uh, and, and antibiotic resistant. Um, you would imagine that the, if you ever took a look at these people's intestines, it just shredded and, you know, you know, leaky gut. I'm not even sure you could call it a gut in some cases. It's just awful. Um, you would, you can't imagine any other scenario. I can't imagine any other scenario where somebody would be, you know, at risk if, the fecal transplant that was being implanted in them uh, had any, you know, sequence of pathogen, or if there's going to be something untoward, because these people are immunosuppressed, they have, um, you know, huge problems, and yet there's a 90, you know, it's, it's, it's nearly a 98 percent cure rate, and with a a really dodgy sort of, to me, what seems like a dodgy sort of selection of the donor, you know, it's usually the unit nurse, you know. <laughs> doesn't have any big health problems or something like that. It's just, you know, there's really no, not a lot of science be behind it. But yet, the point is, is that there, there's, it's got the ick factor, but probably not as much risk factor as we, uh, as, as we uh, might think otherwise, at least if you can use the C. difficile experience as a guiding principle.